If you thought McGill's dark side was just a collection of spooky old buildings, think again. The university that unlocked the secrets of the atom and first mapped the human brain has also spawned some of the most sinister and bloodthirsty criminals of the last 200 years. They may have been perfect angels when they first stepped through the Roddick gates, but something happened during their star-crossed studies. Something that made them into monsters, serial killers, and terrorists. And now, in honor of McGill's bicentennial year, here are the nominees for... The Worst McGillian. In a rare lapse of Canadian modesty, McGill University spent its 190th birthday holding a contest to find the greatest McGillian, the single most accomplished alumnus or professor in the history of McGill University. I think what is really amazing about Dr. Penfield is that he created this institute. Over 700 big shot alumni cast 60,000 votes for their favorite McMuckety Muck, and a good time was had by all around. Now, if you're anything like me, you were thinking only one thing. Please, for the love of Tribbles, don't choose William Shatner. I'm going to tell you why I'm the greatest McGill that ever was. McGill already gave Captain Kirk an honorary doctorate. We named a building the size of the USS Enterprise after him. And frankly, the joke is getting old. The world's hammiest actor may have graduated from Canada's finest university, but he never taught a class, never won a Nobel Prize. He never became the first nonagenarian in outer space. Okay, he did do that which was pretty amazing. But back in 2011, when this ridiculous contest was held, Shatner's most inspiring act was to get paid in Priceline.com stock during the dot-com boom of the 1990s. The reason I came to McGill is to get the best type of medical training. Thankfully, McGill came to its senses, passed on Dr. Shatner, and chose instead Emeritus Professor of Physiology, Dr. Thomas Chang, as the greatest McGillian. Dr. Chang kick-started the field of biotechnology in 1957 by inventing the first artificial cell as an undergraduate in his dorm room. Now, had they asked me, I would have picked the greatest experimental physicist of all time. That's this guy, Ernest Rutherford. We live in an atmosphere dim with the flying fragments of exploding atoms. Or maybe the greatest McGillian also happens to be the greatest prime minister in Canadian history. Of course, I'm talking about Justin Trudeau's second favorite prime minister. Wilfrid Laurier. Now this year is McGill's 200th birthday, and having already selected McGill's best, it's high time to pick McGill's worst. And that's not an easy job, because it turns out that McGill produces more supervillains than Hanna-Barbera's Legion of Doom. This field is so competitive that even your garden variety fascist former YouTuber won't make the grade. You know, I've spoken against white nationalism, but I'm an empiricist. To win this contest, you've got to be a legit evil genius, the kind of depraved maniac that could only be made by McGill. With 200 years of ambitious alumni, the standards for skullduggery are even higher than the faculty of the McGill Center for Cannabis Research. And when Shatner's alma mater gets high, we go low. And I'm gonna be high. So without further ado, I hereby give you the nominees for... The Worst McGillian. Thomas Neal Cream, newly minted MD and Master of Surgery, was the pride of the class of 1876. Since his farewell address was titled The Evils of Malpractice in the Medical Profession, and his PhD thesis was on the effects of chloroform, you'd have thought a clever McGillian might have raised an eyebrow. Little did they know that Dr. Cream would soon lead a double life as a serial murderer with more success in the craft of killing than his contemporary, Jack the Ripper, making Cream both the terror of his age and a highly unlikely candidate to be featured in a McGill brochure for prospective students. The lurid tale of Dr. Thomas Cream begins inside McGill's first medical building, at a time when infection was little understood and death by surgery a routine occurrence. Cream earns his medical degree under the tutelage of Dr. William Osler, 
who instructs him in the medical arts that will prove most useful to him, obstetrics and bloodletting. On graduation, Dr. Cream opens his private practice in Ontario. Within a year, the lifeless body of his girlfriend, Kate Gardner, pregnant and poisoned by chloroform, is found in the alleyway behind Cream's office. It is his first killing. There will be as many as eight more. Questioned by police, the smooth-talking surgeon blames a local businessman and skips town. In Chicago, Dr. Cream reopens for business in the red light district, specializing in backstreet abortions. He called his female patients a menace to society and spoke openly of his desire to rid the earth of their presence. In a new country, with a clean record, his ambition for killing only grows. Every few months, another one of his patients dies. The cause is always the same the agonizing convulsions and paralysis of the lungs that are the hallmarks of poisoning by strychnine. On the side, Cream makes a killing from his killings by blackmailing the pharmacists who fill his poisonous prescriptions. But the dapper doctor's downfall is overconfidence. Cream and his mistress, Julia Stott, conspire to murder her epileptic husband. When he dies after treatment, Cream again blackmails the pharmacist. But this time, the threat is recorded in a handwritten letter. With the letter as evidence, Chicago police arrest the couple. Julia Stott confesses to the crime, and her husband's body is exhumed. The autopsy reveals enough strychnine in him to kill him three times over. Cream is sentenced to life in Joliet prison. The prison doors open for Thomas Cream in 1891, when the governor commutes his term. Using money inherited from his father, he sets sail for London and settles in its most hardened slum. A decade behind bars has done nothing to diminish his appetite for blood. He poisons four more women and attempts a fifth, terrorizing the city before Scotland Yard discovers a fresh trail of blackmail letters. Now police surveil his every move. When they discover his murder conviction in America, they arrest him. Cream's murder trial lasts five days. The jury takes 10 minutes to convict him of four murders and an attempted fifth. On the morning of November 15th, 1892, thousands of Londoners descend on Newgate Prison. It's the largest crowd to gather at an execution site in London since public hangings had been brought to an end 20 years earlier. McGill engineering professor Gerald Bull aimed to build the most powerful cannon the world had ever seen and sell it to the world's worst governments. Just how evil was Gerald Bull? Let's put it this way. In the HBO movie of his life story, Kevin Spacey played the good guy. Thanks. When do I get the pieces of silver? But Bull wasn't always such a massive bag of dicks. He was once a brilliant engineer, the youngest PhD in Canadian history. And as director of McGill's Space Research Institute, Bull founded the High Altitude Research Project, known as Project HARP. The man behind the project is McGill's 34-year-old professor of engineering science, Dr. Jerry Bull, an intense, impatient genius who has been working for five years on a cut-rate research program. Funded by the American and Canadian militaries, Bull would design the world's first space gun. No, not that kind of space gun. Like Jules Verne's 1865 novel, From the Earth to the Moon, the Project Harp gun would be powerful enough to launch a satellite into orbit. Bull pitched the gun not as a weapon, but as a cheap way to blast Canada into the space race.
Bull set up shop at McGill's then-new Caribbean campus, the Bel Airs Research Institute in Barbados. In between sipping guava berry daiquiris and honing his beach volleyball game, Bull and his crack squad of McGill engineers built the Harp Gun. More than a few islanders began to wonder whether somebody hadn't completely lost his mind when a great 16-inch naval gun was mounted on the beach here and McGill announced that it was going to send a space research vehicle 10 times higher into the atmosphere than any gun had ever fired before. The Harp gun was a massive experimental cannon. It launched hundreds of dart-finned Martlet missiles, yes, named after those Martlets, as high as 180 kilometers into the ionosphere. Three, two, one. It's a ballistics altitude record that stands to this day. Things were going swimmingly for our Archvillian McGillian until the U.S. and Canadian governments decided that rocket power was more efficient than an insanely large gun, and they reduced Bull's funding to zero. That's when Bull went solo. He turned to the Bronfman family, yes, that Bronfman family, for a cash infusion. Now a well-heeled freelancer, Gerald Bull designed weapons for the highest bidders. With the blessing of the United States government, Bull sold heavy weaponry to South Africa and China. The RCMP staged a series of raids on a Quebec company today, the Space Research Corporation. When the press discovered the illegal sales, the U.S. turned on Bull and he was arrested by customs agents. And he spent six months in the federal slammer. Bull felt betrayed. To see people trying to degrade me personally is a common criminal. For what? On his release, he turned against the United States and began working for their arch enemy, Saddam Hussein. Bull improved the design of Iraq's arsenal of Scud missiles. He also designed the Al Fao artillery system for the Iraqi army. Then he built the Baby Babylon, a 46 meter cannon forged into the side of a mountain that was test fired in the remote desert outside of Baghdad in 1989. The test was a terrifying success. Three, two, one. Big as it was, the Baby Babylon was a prototype for something much more powerful. These images of seized cannon tubes show Bull's most ambitious weapon, the Project Babylon Supergun. This record-smashing cannon would stand taller than the Statue of Liberty. It would be capable of launching 2,000-kilogram missiles into orbit, allowing Baghdad to strike any country on the planet. Despite, or perhaps because, he possessed the surname of an uncastrated male bovine, it's safe to say that Dr. Gerald Bull suffered from the greatest case of penis envy in the 200-year history of McGill University, if not all mankind. For better or for best, Gerald Bull was assassinated before he could finish assembling the supergun. Six months after his death, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Bull's artillery cannons fired at American troops, while his improved Scud missiles were raining down on Tel Aviv. To this day, no one knows who killed Gerald Bull. But between you, me, and the CBC, let's just say it was the Mossad. Tonight on The Fifth Estate, reporter Lyndon McIntyre reveals evidence that the Israeli Secret Service, the Mossad, killed Bull because he was designing a deadly new weapon for Iraq, a supergun. 